In this week's episode of Bleach the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Ichigo and his friends blast off to the royal palace. Oetsu seemingly eliminates Yuha Bucks, Schutzstoffel, and even more of the truth is revealed from a thousand years ago. What an incredible episode of Bleach. Episode 24, Too Early to Win, Too Late to Know, brought us the start of the promised duel between the Zero Division and Yuha Bucks forces to decide the fate of the Bleach universe, but it also delivered on so much more than that. More than I ever imagined it would. This is probably going to be a long one. A lot of you have been asking for a review that hits the hour-long mark, and this one might finally do it. Even after having a few days now to decompress and rewatch the episode a few times, I can still scarcely believe what I'm watching during that opening scene. Those of us who read the source material week in, week out, were asking, begging for this sort of thing, this sort of historical context throughout the arc's entire run, and we never really got it, merely scratching the surface at points. The very crux of this arc's namesake, the Thousand Year Blood War, was the history that unfolded between these characters, and for the longest time, the best we could do was imagine. Imagine the history between Yuhabak and the Soul Society. Imagine the past shared by characters like Yuhabak and Ichibe, who called the Quincy King the same troublesome brat he ever was. What did that mean? How did these two know each other? I've gone on record many times before saying the Thousand Year Blood War is my favourite Bleach arc. It's the most ambitious the series ever became, and as a real Bleach lore nerd, I love it for that. But at the same time, there's no denying the list of questions left over from the arc is totally endless. But the anime is slowly chipping away at that. Of course, we had the amazing flashback in episode 7, featuring the original Gote 13 and the battle in Seireite itself a thousand years ago, and now this. And to think we might only be getting started. Who knows what secrets cores 3 and 4 might hold. Anyway, I need to move on. There's going to be plenty of time to discuss the flashback very soon. However, regarding the episode itself, thankfully, art is still very strong. Everything looks wonderful, and I can't pretend I'm not happy to be mostly free of the red sky. Artistically, it was a cool and bold choice, very domineering, and there was something novel about the Thousand Year Blood War taking place beneath a blood-soaked sky. But this is a real breath of fresh air. But yeah, I'm confident that the last two episodes will also look amazing, so I think this core is going to end in a truly explosive fashion. Like, this is going to be an incredible ride. Honestly, let's just get on with this. I am so excited to dive into this week's episode. I knew the episode title was a good omen. And so, as we begin our in-depth spoiler review and discussion of the Thousand Year Blood War episode 24, Too Early to Win, Too Late to Know, as always, I'll be looking at this episode from the perspective of someone who has read all of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, meaning there will be potential spoilers for the entire arc to follow, and really never has that been more true than this week's episode, as we take a look at this episode to see what it added, what it changed, and what it took away from the source material. However, before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet make sure to do that now for more bleach content like this every single week and if you enjoyed the video when you're done with it make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel and if you want to take that support for me another step further i do also have a patreon as well if you wanted to support me over a patreon you get your name in the credits and you can get these videos totally ad free as well and as always an enormous shout out and a massive thank you goes out to everyone supporting me over on patreon i really do appreciate each and every one of you and i have to just give a shout out to all of you in general for the enormous show of support on the last reaction. It was a very exciting episode, and I'm glad that permeated with the rest of you as well. So that was just really fantastic to see. So again, thank you all so very much. Now, in terms of what's covered this week, well, we're a little all over the place. I think this should be interesting for sure, if not making things a little more difficult. On the plus side, again, very few chapters were actually used this week, freeing up a huge chunk of the episode at the start for that brand new flashback. 
Interestingly, rather than adapting whole chapters at a time, the anime is doing a lot of rearranging this week, cherry-picking necessary pages from certain chapters and slotting them in where needed. Anyway, these are the chapters covered this week. You might have to bear with me as it's no longer that straightforward. We have a couple of pages from chapter 588, The Headless Star 7, which has been completely carved up to the point of being unrecognisable at this point. Several pages from chapter 597, Winded by the Shadow, after we saw some of that chapter in last week's episode. And yes, I think it probably is winded, despite that not actually being a word. Then we have several complete chapters. Chapter 598, The Shooting Star Project, we only have to beat you mix. Chapter 599, Too Early to Win, Too Late to Know. The episode's title, and like I've said before, probably my favourite chapter title in the series. Chapter 600, Snipe, also the original name for the series before Kubo settled on Bleach. Chapter 601, Verge on Vermilion, and finally the last three pages of chapter 604, revitalize. That might sound like a lot, but it really isn't. It's essentially four chapters being covered, with a sprinkling of pages from other chapters included. Crucially, as you can see, the ending of chapter 604 is here, but we're missing chapters 602 and 603, and the majority of 604, which means the anime has jumped right over the entire battle in the Royal Palace that I covered in a recent video, and made things very interesting indeed. Anyway, from all of the new content to the changes to our predictions for some very big episodes incoming, there's a lot to do here today, so let's dive into it. Right, so there's obviously tons going on here at the start of the episode, and I'll try my best to deliver an analysis of what I think is actually happening here, the ramifications this has for the story of Bleach and more. But I am thinking of also dedicating a separate video to this as well, because really, this is a momentous deal. At the start of episode 24 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, we're treated to a beefy flashback from a thousand years ago. And this is all, may I emphasise, entirely new content. Most of this was barely hinted at in the source material, yet it's the type of historical context that was so sorely needed throughout the original series run. The flashback starts with a picture that's immediately fascinating a view of the capital of the Lichtreich itself. Yuhabark's Empire of Light is essentially the Quincy nation on Earth that existed a thousand years ago. If you want an idea of just how much history and context the anime is adding, the term Lichtreich wasn't even mentioned in the source material until chapter 631, a good four volumes or so from where we are currently, and the anime has been talking about the Lichtreich as an entity since episode 7. Before we begin discussing the flashback, I actually want to go a little further back in time, and this is where that spoiler warning comes in, to the events depicted in the Friend Saga later on. As we learn during the Friend Saga, Yuhabak, who as of a thousand years ago had been alive for about 200 years at that point, was busy conquering an unnamed country. It's hard to know exactly how much land actually belongs to him, we only hear that he has recently conquered the Northern Territories, but according to his right-hand man at the time, Zedritz, there are no regions left for them to conquer. Either way, it's clear that a thousand years ago, an entire entire country on Earth fell under the rule of the Quincy Lichtreich, and clearly this didn't go unnoticed by the Soul Society, especially once Yuhabark's ambitions turned towards them. I don't want to talk about the Friend Saga too much, but it's fascinating. The Friend Saga takes place before this new flashback, as we see Yuhabark has the Almighty when he declares his intent to form the Sternritter, a unit capable of taking on the Soul Society themselves. Themselves. So clearly, Yuhabak is amassing a force to attack the Soul Society, and that's where this new flashback then comes in. One thing I really want to do when we have all the information is compile a full Vandenreich timeline, or even just a full timeline of the Bleach universe itself. Anyway, the flashback begins, revealing the Lichtreich's capital city in all of its holy splendour, the sun shining down upon it. 
Notice how there isn't a trace of ice yet. Clearly that rot must set in during the years spent within the shadows after the war. The scene moves inside and we're shown an impressive meeting hall. Flags draped on the walls, adorned with the enormous Y that designated the Lichtreich. The Empire wouldn't move to the five-pointed symbol we know today until the instigation of the creation of the Sternritter. Having said that, based on the timeline, as I said a minute ago, Yuhabark has already begun creating the Sternritter by now, and as we see in the Friends Saga, that new symbol is in effect. So maybe they just haven't updated the iconography yet. Let's take a moment to address everyone present. In the centre of the hall, at the heads of the table sit Ichibe and Yuhabark. Immediately, this is enormous. In the grand scheme of things, we're only a thousand years into the past. Presumably the royal palace is already a thing that Ichibe is guarding, so for him to personally come down to Earth is a massive undertaking and shows a great deal of respect towards Yuhabak, even if it maybe is only surface level, but we'll get into that. Interestingly, Ichibe is already wearing the uniform of the Gote 13, which implies that Senjumaru is around at the time, weaving the uniform that would eventually, or maybe already has, earned her a position in the Zero Division. Next, across from him, we have Yuhabak himself. The Quincy King is a mere 200 years old or so at this point, and his appearance reflects that of him in the Friend Saga. This is the closest resemblance to old man Zangetsu we get to see of his. Over to the side we see several Quincy guarding the room. Three of them we're familiar with already. There's Hubert, who would eventually become the vice captain of the Sternritter. In fact, it's possible he already is, as Yuhabak has already recruited Hashwolf by this point. Argola and Zedritz, who, like I said, seems to be Yuhabak's second in command during these early days. However, there's a fourth, brand new character that is given some prominence. A female Quincy who, as we see later, is packing a rather interesting weapon, particularly for the time period. There is speculation as to who this character might be, and we'll talk about that some more later, but it seems as though Kubo has actually already given us some information regarding her and the other Quincy in this scene. I saw on Reddit, really just before I started writing this video up, that Kubo seems to refer to these four Quincy as the Schutzstoffel, and that would make sense that Yuhabak already has a personal set of royal guards. I wonder if this is going to be something akin to the new iteration of the Espada replacing the old ones. If when Yuhabak forms the Sternritter, we know Leal Barrow is the first Quincy to receive a shrift from him, the first Sternritter, if Leal was so much more powerful that his creation began the swapping out of the Schutzstoffel. And we know as well that Pernida and Gerard didn't receive shrifts from Yuhabak, so upon his discovery of these pieces of the Soul King, that was probably even more of an excuse to cycle out these members. But I don't know for sure. And obviously, four Schutzstoffel a thousand years ago would imply that there have always been four Schutzstoffel. However, of course, in episode 14, we see that there are only three members of the Schutzstoffel standing on the stage alongside Yuhabak. So it's possible he was waiting until the battle was underway to decide who to make the fourth and final member. Now, I'm just going by the subs on Disney Plus here, but Ichibei says something very interesting right off the bat. He says, and I quote, As balancer of the three worlds comprised of the Soul Society, the World of the Living, and Waco Mundo, I came to propose a non-aggression pact. We know that balancer was the original term used to describe Shinigami, so at this point in time, is Ichibe saying he's the lone Shinigami charged with watching over all three of the current worlds? This does make some sense, what with his position as the de facto ruler of all Shinigami, and I wonder if he technically continues to hold that position as lone balancer looking over all three worlds at once, even today. Anyway, the Soul Society has clearly caught wind of the Lichtreich's threat of invasion and considers them at least enough of a threat that they've come to personally put a stop to it. And so Ichibe is sitting down with Yuhabak to try and propose a truce. It seems to me that Yuhabak's intention of destabilizing the world is well known, as Ichibe wants him to leave the state of the world as it currently is to them, while Yuhabak simply sits back and enjoys the prosperity of his empire. 
Ichibei even sweetens the deal, saying the Soul Society won't interfere with the unification of the Quincy's by the Lichtreich. Obviously, this is a pretty huge deal too. Clearly, there are disparate factions of Quincy spread out all over the world, and the total unification of the Quincy race under the banner of one empire is very bad news for the Soul Society. However, the status quo of the world is paramount above all else, and Ichibei seems, at least on the surface, willing to make that concession. Ichibei says that it's a win-win for Yuhabak, and technically it is. Yuhabak can continue to foster and build his empire, even bring all Quincy's under his banner, and the Soul Society will have no quarrel with him. However, the scope of Yuhabak's ambition is much greater than that. Yuhabak has a deeper understanding of the world, due to his ability to absorb souls of those he has given power to upon their death, and the fact his empire is basically built off the back of that power. Yuhabak is intimately linked to death. He accuses Ichibei of talking to him as though he were just an ignorant baby, sugarcoating the truth of the world and presenting him with only surface-level facts. Of course, Ichibei says that he never meant to insult Yuhabak, but the truth is that, yes, he doesn't know anything at all, despite what he might think. Yuhabak notes that the world was once one, what we know to be the primordial world, where life and death were one and the same, before asking Ichibei who built boundaries within that eternal peace by separating life and death. Ichibei tells Yuhabak that it was the Soul King's doing, with an extremely sinister and, in my opinion, untrustworthy look on his face. Yuhabak then follows up by asking who brought the fear of death to the people, to which Ichibei replies that was also the Soul King. Of course, what Ichibei and Yuhabak are referring to here is the splitting of the One World into the three we know it as today, using the power of the Almighty. Yuhabak reveals that he knows the fear of all whose souls return to him, he knows of how they fear death and attempt to cling to their fleeting lives. We see an awesome visual of souls constantly flowing back into Yuhabak, revealing that he must suffer through this anguish on a near constant basis. In the face of all this torment, that is the answer that Ichibei sees fit to give him? So here's what I think is happening here. Ichibei is lying to Yuhabak, or at the very best telling him just a half-truth. While in a sense it was technically the Soul King who created the cycle of life and death using the Almighty, we also know, unless it is substantially changed from how it was written in Can't Fear Your Own World, that the ancestors of the five noble houses, the progenitors of Shinigami themselves, were involved, betraying and mutilating the king and leaving him a withered shell of himself, using his power of the Almighty to create the worlds as we know them. In simply telling Yuhabak that the Soul King is responsible alone for everything, Ichibei is continuing to try and keep him in the dark, while obfuscating the depth of the Shinigami's involvement. Of course, it's totally possible the anime will change the history of the world as written in Can't Fear Your Own World, but we'll have to see. I love the little detail of Yuhabak calling Ichibei by his name, and Ichibei warning him against it. It's like after the first use, you won't lose your voice, but we know that Yuhabak keeps on pushing it, keeps on using it, and so eventually loses his voice during their battle. The next sequence is also a little confusing because we still don't hold all the answers. But Yuhabak asks Ichibei where in these three worlds can one truly find peace anymore before revealing he has the power of the Almighty as his irises split into two. At the same time, Ichibei promises to show him the truth. Interestingly, Yuhabak currently only has two irises per eye. I've detailed this before in a video on the Almighty itself, but we know that there are stages, a hierarchy of sorts, to this power, denoted by how many irises the user currently has. 
The Soul King has the most absolute form of the Almighty, with four irises per eye, and can see not only the entire future as laid out before him right up until the point of his very death, but can avoid being seen by lesser forms of the Almighty itself, as we see when Mimihagi's movements are hidden from Yuhabark's sight in the future. So, I'm guessing Yuhabark's power right now is incomplete. His Almighty transforms during his battle with Ichibe, giving him three irises per eye, but right now I presume he can only see a certain amount? But as Yuhabark claims to be able to see it all, Ichibe throws out his left hand towards the king as something begins to rip and bubble on his palm. At the same time, the guards, expecting an attack, launch into action. The mysterious Quincy girl summons her spirit weapon, a machine gun, before blasting Ichibe with hundreds of reishi rounds. Obviously, it's interesting that this girl has an automatic weapon like this long before they were even invented, but I'm most intrigued by why she's getting so much spotlight. Who is she, if anyone at all? One of the prevailing theories I've seen is that she's actually Pernida herself, or at the very least, the host. She'll eventually become the host of the Soul King's left arm. I kind of like this theory, and personally, I always thought that there was going to be some kind of human element to Pernida revealed during its battle. Of course, in the source material at least, that turned out not to be true, and the tiny hand of Pernida's was later explained away as something Kubo changed his mind on. A concept he was originally going to go with before dropping it. But it would be cool if this character was a little more than she appears to be. However, Ichibe effortlessly blocks her blasts with what appears to be his sealed Zan Pakto. It's hard to tell for certain, but it looks like he's holding up a large brush, the bristles opened up at the top like a flower, which seems to act as a shield of sorts, capturing the bullets before firing them back at the Quincy. As the bullets come rushing back, Argola leaps in front of his comrades to defend them. However, it's what happens next that is the most peculiar part of all. Ichibe's palm opens up to reveal a grotesque yet very familiar eye featuring two pupils. This is none other than the left arm of the Soul King. Based on the sequence of events, it seems Ichibe uses the left arm to show the truth to Yuhabak, flooding his mind with revelations, the same images Ichigo saw upon Irazu Sando. However, there are two new haunting images. In the aftermath of his mutilation, we see what's left of the Soul King's mannequin-like body being cradled by Ichibe, who looks extraordinarily evil as he looks down upon the fallen god. Yuhabak gasps in shock. So that is the true nature of the Soul King. So I have a couple of questions here before we move on, the most pressing one being, how is Ichibe wielding the Soul King's left arm, and why? I guess a few reasons are possible, both of which stem from the outcome of that final image. If Ichibe was present at the moment of the Soul King's dismemberment, then he could have either forcibly taken the left arm for himself, perhaps to try and wield some of the Soul King's power for some reason, becoming its host, or the Soul King's left arm, with its sentience, simply chose Ichibe as a host in that moment. My second question is, why did Ichibe decide to show Yuhabak the truth after all? It could be because of the questions Yuhabak was asking. Ichibe realised the Quincy King wasn't a fool and wouldn't be so easily placated after all, and so needed to know the truth of the world, but at the same time it was also to humble him. As Ichibe states afterwards, Yuhabak indeed knew nothing at all of the truth of the world, and that's why he needed to be put in his place. Ichibe is essentially making an argument for not destroying the Soul Society. They are necessary for maintaining this fragile world along with the Soul King, because of what they did to him. One thing to remember about Ichibe is that he is a totally heartless, almost machine-like individual. Not through any sense of villainy, but sheer pragmatism. He is inhuman, and that's the point. He's meant to be above all of that. So, where others might see the fate of the Soul King as tragic, even disgusting to behold, Ichibe merely thinks that what's done is done, this is how things were meant to be, and the status quo must be protected at all costs. Yuhabak 
interestingly, is the total opposite. He's a very emotional individual, one whose heart has been battered by years of struggle and torment on behalf of the dying souls of his people. Where Ichibe is content to let horrible things play out if that's how they're supposed to be, Yuhabak cannot accept it. Rather than humbling him, seeing the truth only enrages him further as he screams that not only is the Soul King's true state pitiful to behold, it is repulsive. Activating Blute Vein across his body, presumably in preparation for Ichibe to counter-attack, he lunges for Ichibe, grabbing the Soul King's left arm. In that moment, Yuhabak reveals that thanks to the Almighty, he can see all, revealing that it seems like Ichibe was planning to try and kill him with that arm. As the Quincy King forces his Ryatsu into the left arm's veins, he tells Ichibe that his father's arm is nothing more than a sacrifice, capable of giving life, but unable to take it away, and it seems like he wants to take the arm for himself. Perhaps Yuhabak believes the arm belongs to him, seeing as it was once his father's. Also, it's interesting that the anime just totally nonchalantly gives up the fact that the Soul King is Yuhabak's father, when that's a major part of the reveal at the end of chapter 611. Ichibe, realising that he seems to have been exposed, muses that Yuhabak's eyes sure are troublesome, but reveals that they can never see through the Soul King. We already know this. The Soul King is the one individual able to slip by Yuhabak. Yuhabak's Almighty. I originally thought this meant Yuhabak was unable to discern his father's current intentions and is shocked when the left arm leaves Ichibei's body and enters Yuhabak's as his new host. But actually, if Yuhabak was aiming to take the arm from the beginning, then when Ichibei says he can't see through the Soul King, presumably that is referring to Yuhabak losing the Almighty upon becoming the host of the left arm. Presumably because the Soul King's absolute version of the Almighty quashes Yuhabak's. But of course, this is all speculation on my part. As the left arm enters Yuhabak's body, his Almighty disappears completely, returning his eyes to normal. Ichibei merely asks if he thought he'd let him take the left arm for free, but again I find this sequence to be a little confusing. Did Ichibe therefore have any control over what just happened? Did he actively give Yuhabak the left arm knowing it would seal his almighty? If so, how did he do that? Either way, Ichibe seems to know what will happen next, telling Yuhabak that his eyes will now be closed forever, never to open until the day you die. Ichibe leaves, simply telling the Quincy King to live a modest life. It's a final departing insult, basically telling him to stay in his lane as he's lost his true power and now can't contend with the will of the Soul Society. Of course, we know Yuhabak doesn't abide by this advice and would still launch his assault on the Soul Society in the near future, leading to his forces being decimated and disappearing into hiding for a thousand years as the Licht Reich collapses. I wonder if this is also foreshadowing how the anime will return Yuhabak's almighty to him. When Ichibe pushes Yuhabak to the brink of death during their battle, that's when Yuhabak's powers will reawaken. Though he's no longer the host of the left arm and presumably hasn't been for some time, which again makes me wonder, when did he dispel the left arm and presumably bestow it upon a different host? Maybe it is this Quincy girl, and perhaps the left arm was so powerful that it completely consumed her, which is why Pernida appears as simply the arm itself. After the meeting, Yuhabak sits alone, grateful to have lost the Almighty as he no longer has to be a spectator to his father's humiliation. Though again, that's kind of interesting to me, since this seems to be the very first time he ever saw that. So I'm not again entirely sure how that works, unless by giving or showing Yuhabak those revelations with the almighty active Yuhabak would have to relive them forever, perhaps? I'm not entirely sure. But he says that although the Soul King has become little more than a mindless lump of flesh to be worshipped, he will give him a new purpose. Presumably talking of how he plans to take his father's power to restore the Quincy Nation. Well, as expected, this took up a massive portion of the video. I do still want to talk about this separately as well, but for now I'll just say this was a wonderful flashback and is one of my favourite sequences of the entire Thousand Year Blood War anime to date. Yes, 
we have more questions, but we have answers too. We know how the left arm came into Yuha Bark's possession, we know why it serves him, and we know where Yuha Bark's hatred of what his father has become came from too. We also know that Yuha Bark definitely didn't have the Almighty when he battled Yamamoto, which is quite key as well. I'm greedy though, I sincerely hope we get more and more of this sort of thing, totally fleshing out the entirety of the Soul King's backstory, along with the likes of Yuha Bark and Ichibei. Moments like this do so much for their characters. Both Yuha Bark and Ichibei, two of the most important figures in Bleach, yet also some of the most enigmatic, benefited greatly from this flashback. Yuha Bark more so, crucially giving our main villain some much needed humanity. Yuha Bark tells his father to vanish along with this world and become nothing more than a grave to the current state of three worlds. The anime is doing a far better job of establishing Yuha Bark's ultimate goal too. Remember in the source material that we didn't learn the truth behind Yuha Bark's goal until the very final chapter, chapter 686, which is insanity. It's very telling as well that a lot of the new scenes we're getting involve the Soul King. He was always the series' greatest mystery and deserved to be explored considerably more than the threadbare amount he was originally. There is an awful lot going on here, there's just so much to talk about, but with that we do finally return to the present, chapter 588, and a much older Yuha Bark looks upon the royal palace for the first time. Hashwolf mentions he feels his pain, but Yuha Bark merely says he doesn't feel anything looking at this decaying grave. Grave. He knows what his father has become, and has known for a thousand years. Of course, questions still exist. How did Yuha Bark even come into being? How did he spend his earliest years? We still need more on Rayo himself, but for now I couldn't be happier with the start of this episode, as evidenced by how long we've been talking about it. Anyway, Yuha Bark gets a new line, again reinforcing his motivation and his hatred towards the Soul Society as he says they will erase this world full of deceit and build a new world of true peace with their own hands. Hashwolf summons a group of Soldat who escape the shadows and land on the ground beside their king. They're CG, I believe, but they actually look fairly good here, to be honest. Here to greet them is Shutara Senjumaru, flanked on either side by a battalion of the royal palace's divine soldiers, and... Wait a minute. In the blink of an eye, we've caught up to the source material again, and found ourselves halfway through chapter 597, completely skipping over... Tenjiro's entire section of the story, which again, I think I mentioned last week, I thought we would actually see. In the source material, Yuha Bark sends the soldat rushing towards the palace, but they're all swept aside instantly by Tenjiro, who is the first member of the Zero Division to arrive on the scene. Tenjiro challenges Yuha Bark, who is defiant in the face of opposition. Summoning a torrent of boiling hot water, Tenjiro uses it to wash away more of the soldat, incinerating them in the incredible heat. As Yuha Bark is seemingly trapped within the swirling tempest, Tenjiro leaps towards him and activates his Shikai, Kin Pika, which glows brilliantly before we cut away. The next time we see Tenjiro, he's frustrated at being unable to land a single hit on Yuha Bark. Every time he tries to hit him, Yuha Bark inexplicably seems to avoid the attack. Leaving Tenjiro behind, Yuha Bark continues onwards. All of this sequence was removed from the episode, including Tenjiro's Shikai reveal, which does make me wonder if we'll see it next week instead, and maybe even get a better look at it. It's possible the anime is trying to do away with all of the off-screen moments of the Zero Division fight. However, to make things even more confusing, rather than continue with chapter 597 and Senju Maru's appearance, we instead jump forward to the first half of chapter 598, featuring Ichigo and the others. I did predict this might happen, I thought they may pull all of Ichigo's scenes forward, and that's Mostly what happens, though not quite. However, Ganju Shiba arrives riding his warthog Bonnie and demands to come along for the journey. Several comedic moments are cut here, such as Ichigo trying to guess the self-absorbed reasons Ganju might want to come with them, but Ganju explains that he has a roadmap to the royal palace and wants to help defeat the Quincy's. 
I'm surprised they left the roadmap line in here since that was never actually used in the source material at all, but it is nice to see Ganju properly appear again after so long. Though I am a little concerned that the Fullbringers he was helping to train won't have a bigger role than they did in the original story. With Ganju aboard, however, Kisuke prepares to launch the cannon. As the ceiling opens up, what rises out of the lab seems to be the Zero Division's own Tenchuren, which is weird as Ichigo returned to the palace in it back in the first core. And the whole idea was that it couldn't make the trip over and over again, so the 12th Division simply built a replica of Kukaku's canon in its place, not the Tenchuren. Plus, we literally see Ichigo and the others sitting inside something that doesn't look like the Tenchuren, so that feels a bit weird as well, but it doesn't really matter. As Kisuke begins the countdown, the Tenchuren blasts off into the sky, heading towards the royal palace. We get some brief, new follow-up scenes. Byakuya watches from afar as the missile takes off into the sky, while Renji, Rukia and Basby take a break from their battle to look on as well. No one seems to be particularly damaged, so they can't be fighting that hard. And then, unbelievably, we see Robert once again, continuing this really neat little arc the anime has going for him. I love the visual of his glasses, his lens being totally red as he looks into the sky, a resigned look on his face as he lies on the ground, realising he's likely out of time and doomed to die. From their post, Kyoraku, Nanao and Okikiba watch the rocket as well, while Mayuri scoffs that it was a terrible takeoff. These little character moments are great for showing the scope of the battleground, while also neatly linking everything together. And now we find ourselves back in chapter 597 as we return to the confrontation between Yuhabak and Senju Maru. We get a really awesome shot of Yuhabak and his soldat facing off with Senju Maru, who stands atop the flight of stairs leading to the first main platform of the palace. This sequence is changed up slightly as well. In the source material, as Senju Maru says that defeating Genryusai has gone to Yuhabak's head, Yuhabak takes a defiant step towards her. Climbing the staircase with a smirk on his face, full of arrogance and power, believing they don't have what it takes to stand in his way. Unfortunately, this is gone in the anime, which is a shame, as it's a fantastically symbolic sequence. Instead, in the episode, Hashworth commands the Soldat to attack, and Senju Maru does the same, instructing the Soul King's blade to strike. The two forces clash, and the Soldat are almost immediately decimated. Interestingly, some of the imagery from Tenjiro's cut segment seems to be being used here. For example, the shot of the Soldat going flying is very similar to the shot of them being swept aside by Tenjiro's oar, while the one dead Soldat we see has his goggles broken in in the exact same manner as the one who is boiled alive by Tenjiro's water. As Yuhabak continues to advance, the divine soldiers leap towards him, only to find their blades curving strangely around his body. Rising up from Yuhabak's shadow, Sternritter W, the wind Nyanzol Wizol reveals himself, explaining he is the reason none of their attacks are landing. Nyanzol's introduction is changed up a little bit. In the original chapter, he insults the divine soldiers upon his appearance, saying their attacks were never anywhere near close to his majesty. However, in the anime, he introduces himself by immediately explaining the basics of his shrift instead, before he gets his splash screen. And after this, we continue immediately with the second half of chapter 598, featuring Nyanzol's battle against Senju Maru. Nyanzol was barely a character in the original material, but his fight is over so hilariously quickly here in the anime that it kind of feels like they included him mostly out of obligation. That being said, I do like the detail of it sounding like he's struggling to speak clearly due to having two tongues, I appreciate the idea behind his theming is that he's tongue-tied, obviously referencing his power to twist and wind things around, but you think Yuhabar could have done him a favour and just removed the second tongue. Much of Nyanzol's explanation regarding his abilities is cut, due to a lot of it revolving around Tenjiro's earlier appearance, which was also removed. As Senju Maru reveals several more soldiers from their hiding place, they all try and attack Nyanzol, but he bends their swords away from himself with ease. We do get some nice visuals where his finger seems to emit a strange 
pulse-like ripple effect which warps and twists the weapons and then the bodies of the Divine Soldiers before Nyanzal splits several of them in half. As Nyanzal apologises to Senju Maru for not explaining himself clearly, we get to see her power in action. There's a really awesome shot of one of her golden, skeletal hands wielding a sewing needle, a thin strand of purple thread glistening as she works quickly, quietly and unnoticed. Nyanzal mentioned he could turn away any enemy he sees, but Senju Maru says an enemy closest to you is hardest to see, especially if they're already touching your body. She then reveals that in the time he was battling the Divine Soldiers, Senju Maru remade Nyanzol's robe into one of her own design, his Sternritter uniform now displaying the insignia of the Zero Division. Trapping Nyanzol in his own clothes, Senju Maru's line where she explains how she's known for her quick work, and that's where the name Senju Maru comes from, is cut. But she says he should be grateful that a grunt like him even gets to wear an outfit tailored by her, telling him not to accept expect to take it off before he dies. As she says this, the robe suddenly pierces Nyanzol all over his body with hundreds of spikes, instantly killing the Quincy and ending chapter 598. Senju Maru is a really cool character, perhaps the most royal feeling of the Zero Division with her magnificent design and snobbish attitude. I am glad that she gets a moment to shine, immediately butchering a Sternritter like he's nothing. With blood, erupting, leaking from Nyanzol's outfit as we begin chapter 599, Senju Maru apologises for forgetting to remove her sewing needles before at last receiving her splash screen. Nyanzol then collapses to the floor in a huge splatter of blood, dead almost as soon as he appeared. The scene then changes again, yanking us back out of chapter 599 and back in to chapter 598, continuing on from where we left Ichigo and the others last time. Ganju gets a few new lines here, where he's surprised the battle turned into such a mess, thinking for sure the Shinigami would win. He's also surprised that after building such a fine castle, Yuhabak and the others would just abandon it for the royal palace instead. Interestingly, Ganju mentions that Kukaku told him all about the royal palace itself. So again, the Shiba clan seems to have some connection to Ryokyu that the Gote 13 simply don't. Perhaps it's just because that's where they launched Tenchuren from, but I am curious as to the extent of what Kukaku actually knows. Yoroichi, however, immediately discerns that the enemy's target is the Soul King, and she briefly explains to them all what little she knows about him. Chad speculates that Yuhabak is trying to become a god like the Soul King himself, but Ichigo wonders if replacing the Soul King is something that's even possible, revealing that he saw visions of the Soul King during his training and learned that the Soul King is a being that should be so important, so key to the world's stability that he should be impossible to replace. Of course, this is some cool foreshadowing of sorts, as we know that Ichibe has plans for Ichigo to do just that, should they all fail in their mission. Orihime then reminisces, thinking that this scenario reminds her of when they went to save Rukia. Kubo was trying to evoke feelings of the Soul Society arc for sure during this sequence. It's no coincidence that Ganju of all characters turns up in the nick of time to travel with them all. But I like it, I've always liked it, and I think it works really well. That cyclical nature of the story helps to highlight how far they've all come, while also hammering home the new divide that exists between them and Uryu, as he's conspicuously missing from their team this time round. As Orihime hopes that Uryu will come back to them, we see Uryu himself in a new shot, gazing up at the royal palace from afar. Something interesting happens next. Uryu's heart seems to flare up with blue Quincy Reatsu before Blute Vein appears on his eyes. I've seen a lot of people thinking this is a precursor to what Uryu does at the end of the episode, but I don't really see how or why. I don't see why him using the antithesis means Blute Vein would suddenly appear a long time before he actually does it, unless it's just supposed to represent Yuhabak's Quincy Reatsu activating within him as he kind of gets ready to use it in the future, perhaps. But I actually wonder if it is something far simpler than all of that. 
I wonder if Uryu is simply stealing his defences in preparation for a fight to come. Ichigo resolves to bring Uryu back to them no matter what, and the rocket continues to blast upwards towards the royal palace. Personally, I don't think this is the last we've seen of these characters in this core. I expect to see them one final time in episode 26, arriving in the royal palace to revive the fallen Ichibe right before the cliffhanger ending. Unless, of course, the ending is changed considerably. However, as if to mirror the rocket rising up to the palace, the next thing we see is Nyanzol's own body hurtling down to the Seireite far below. This is a new addition, and I really like it. I like how morbid it is. Again, showing how callous Senjumaru can be, that she can't even bear to have this disgusting corpse on their walkway, so she simply picks up the fallen Sternritter and tosses him unceremoniously over the edge. Continuing chapter 599, Senjumaru says they can finally reach Yuhaba. In the source material, Yuhabak challenges her by summoning another wave of soldat first, telling her they can deal with the divine soldiers as he has something else in mind for the Zero Division. However, in the anime, Yuhabak skips straight to summoning his personal royal guard, the Schutzstoffel. As Senjumaru looks on in shock, these four all-powerful Quincy emerge from Yuhabak's shadow. Sternritter X, the X-Axis, Leal Barrow. Sternritter C, the compulsory Pernida Panka Jazz. Sternritter D, the death-dealing Askin Naklavar. And Sternritter M, the miracle Gerard Valkyrie. I know everyone has really been looking forward to seeing these guys, myself included, and to be honest, they don't disappoint. They look amazing, first of all, in the lighting of the Royal Palace as they rise up from the darkness, ready to take on the Zero Division in battle. The order of their introductions is changed slightly from the source material. Leal is now first up with a new line, likely due to his position as the Schutzstoffel's leader, replying to Yuhabak that they already know the answer to whether Senjumaru's swords will be able to reach him or not. Pernida is next, then Askin, who muses that he was the only one lucky enough to be brought up from down below, and so needs to put on a good showing. Gerard is last now, telling Askin that if he doesn't prove his usefulness, he'll cut him down himself. Askin gets a brand new line, where he warily says that he wouldn't want that after being allowed to now live in the first place. Sticking fairly closely to chapter 599, moving forwards, Gerard leaps into action, throwing aside his cloak before charging Senjumaru. The music here is... Perfect. I've mentioned before that this is probably my favourite action piece from the new soundtrack, and it perfectly accompanies Gerard's furious attack. Gerard roars that a woman's slender arm can't stop his sword as Senjumaru draws a large sewing needle, only for Gerard to smash it to pieces. Gerard's sword strike is so strong that it causes the ground beneath it to explode. Senjumaru leaps backwards, summoning the second stage version of the Divine Soldier, the Shield of the Soul King, an enormous figure who comes crashing down onto the walkway behind her. Again, the huge soldier looks great here in the anime, with incredible, booming sound effects working really well. Senjumaru thinks that Pernida has something to say about this, and Leal speaks for it, saying, so what if he's big, before Pernida activates its shrift, instantly twisting, warping, and breaking the gigantic soldier, crushing him into a ball of flesh. The compulsory is a power I've been really looking forward to seeing in the anime, and again, they absolutely crushed it. Pun intended. As Senjumaru looks on in shock, Leel removes his cloak, revealing his sniper rifle, and casually shoots her in the head, obliterating a large part of her skull and seemingly killing her in a single blast. As he does so, we get the episode's title. Moving into chapter 600, Lil looks on as Senjumaru's corpse falls to the ground, blood pooling around her head. It's a visually great sequence. It's really quite dark, and again, it's kind of funny that the anime can now adapt scenes like this totally faithfully, right down to the really quite gruesome shot of the huge puddle of blood around Senjumaru's obliterated head, but draws the line at certain other things. I'm not complaining, I'd pick the gore and brutality too if I had to, as it really sets the Thousand Year Blood War arc apart from the rest of the series. 
but it does make me laugh. Gerard's line where he berates Lil for killing Senjumaru in front of Yuhabak is removed, as is Lil asking for Pernida's help. I particularly liked the uh, one translation where he asks Pernida for a hand. Instead, Pernida cleans up the mess immediately, unprompted, and we see Senjumaru's body violently snapped, broken, and rolled up into a ball before being presumably rolled off the side of the walkway, much in the same way she treated Nianzo. As Gerard remarks on how easy she was to kill, Lille laments that there's never really been an enemy that wasn't easy for them to beat, which makes me wonder where they were during the Quincy's losing battle against the original Gote, before he proceeds to snipe all five of the Zero Division cities from the sky. Again, it's a cool visual, but as Lille bows to Yuhavark, suddenly the truth is revealed. The entire backdrop transforms around them, the landscape of the royal palace revealed to be nothing more than a fake, emblazoned upon fabrics created by Senjumaru herself. Senjumaru reveals the fake city was designed purely to lure them in, while Ichibe, a cool detail here of course being that Senjumaru, and we'll see later on other royal guard members as well, refer to him as Osho, not even his own comrades are permitted to speak his name freely, he is the one who has concealed it with his true power. Leal prepares to fire at the newly revealed city, only for his bullet to be blocked by a massive tree trunk, many of which suddenly spring up around the landing platform, sealing the Quincy inside an enormous cage. Askin sweats nervously as Gerard curses the Zero Division and their weird tricks, as Hikifune reveals the cage was her doing. Leal tries to break free of the cage by blasting the trees, but finds it's impossible. I appreciate the anime keeping in Gerard ribbing Lille over his inability to break through them. One thing you'll come to notice about the Schutzstoffel is that they definitely seem to have a tighter sense of camaraderie compared to the other Sternritter, likely stemming from the fact they don't need to compete with each other for their lives. However, Hikifune breaks down exactly how her cage of life was built, telling Lille that the trees won't pass up something as delicious as his bullets made of reishi. She says no matter their abilities, they won't be able to pass through the cage's bars. It seems like the Schutzstoffel are caught. So far, so similar to the source material. The actual invasion since chapter 599, maybe even 598 really, has pretty much played out the same as it did originally. In my video breaking down the battle between these two sides, I speculated that if the anime was going to make sizable changes, they'd make them from chapter 604 onwards. And while I still think that's technically going to be true, the changes actually begin even earlier than I really anticipated. We then get a brilliant new sequence where Tenjiro, he's finally arrived to do something, drops down from the top of the cage, landing at the foot of the stairs in front of the Schutzstoffel, steaming hot water splashing around his feet as he hits the ground. All four members of the Zero Division then arrive on the scene, fully introducing themselves one by one. Squad Zero First Officer, Holy Guardian of the East Hot Springs Demon, Kurinji Tenjiro, followed by Squad Zero Fourth Officer, Holy Guardian of the North, Great Weaver, Shutara Senjumaru, who appears from behind a series of fabric curtains. Squad Zero Second Officer, Holy Guardian of the South, Grain King, Kiryo Hikifune, then comes flying in, generating vines from the palms of her hands to sling herself down to the ground. We have never seen her really do anything like this at all. We've never seen her powers utilised in this form, so it does get me kind of excited for what might happen next week. Finally, a spotlight bursts into life, and the number one Zanpakuto creator, presumably, although he doesn't actually say it, Squad Zero Third Officer, Holy Guardian of the East, Blade God, Oetsu Nimaya appears, dropping his enormous crate of liquid, his unusual sheath, onto the wooden floor beside him. And as we reach the end of chapter 600, Oetsu draws a blade from the centre of the liquid, telling the Schutzstoffel they've got no path to walk on before them, then challenging them to come at them all together. This scene might not seem like much to the untrained eye, but it's very exciting. 
First of all, this is all new. The Zero Division mostly defended the palace in isolated stages in the source material, but here they're all showing up together to cut off the Quincy, even going so far as to fully introduce themselves one at a time. In the source material, I believe the only character to have their full title revealed was Tenjiro. Also, briefly speaking about that, I wonder what relevance the first, second, third, etc. officer title actually has, as it doesn't seem to denote when they were accepted into the Zero Division itself, as as far as we're aware, Hikifune is probably the most recent addition, having joined up just before Turn Back the Pendulum, yet here she's the second officer. But anyway, now though all members of the Zero Division bar Ichibei are here, and they look to be preparing to fight together. In the original chapter, it really felt like Oetsu was down on the walkway alone, facing the Schutzstoffel by himself. While that is very cool in its own way, this idea of a lone wolf member of the Zero Division just taking on all of the Schutzstoffel himself, being so confident as to not really need any of the others around, although Tenjiro does show up to help him later, I won't lie, this does give me a lot of hope for episode 25 and a proper battle featuring all four of these members. However, we're not done just yet. Chapter 601 begins, and as Oetsu tends to his sword's rickety blade, Gerard attacks. The hulking Quincy leaps forward and swings his blade in a massive arc, but Oetsu simply bends over backwards to avoid the slash. The detail of the pressure from Gerard's swing seriously damaging the trees around them is still here, which is very cool. To be honest, considering how damaged the trees are in the anime, they look more damaged here than they were in the source material. I'm surprised Gerard doesn't just swing his sword a few more times directly at them. As Gerard prepares his next attack, however, Oetsu simply puts him down. Moving so quickly they couldn't even see his sword, Oetsu coldly takes Gerard out, the Sternritter hitting the floor with a heavy thud before blood spurts from his back like a fountain. Horrified, Askin looks on in shock as Oetsu reveals his blade kills people in one swing. Leel tries to rationalise what happened, believing Oetsu is using a trick. Again, I like how confident he is that Oetsu couldn't have killed Gerard with such a simple strike, showing how they do all kind of have each other's back. At the very least, they believe in each other's power. But as Leel shoots Oetsu, the bullet simply splits in two upon striking Oetsu's outstretched blade. Oetsu then darts forward, slicing and deflecting all of Leel's shots before slashing the Sternritter across the torso, killing him instantly. Next, Oetsu turns his attention to Pernida, who prepares to attack. In this brief moment, you can fairly clearly tell what it is, I think, but Oetsu simply launches his sword through the centre of Pernida's hood. There's a really fantastic and cinematic moment here. The music builds and builds throughout this confrontation, but suddenly, as Pernida collapses, it dies out only to immediately return as Oetsu blitzes into life, the Shinigami landing on Pernida and retrieving his sword. Everything moves so incredibly fast here. The speed is fully emphasised in this moment to show you exactly what the Schutzstoffel are truly up against here. In a flash, Askin twists around as Oetsu moves to cut him, the force of the strike sending Askin flying backwards, but alive. Oetsu commends Askin for being the only one to recognise the true sharpness of the blade and leap backwards in time to match the speed of the strike. But as Askin chuckles that Oetsu saw through it anyway, Oetsu simply steps in without a word and calmly slashes his throat. There's an intriguing sound that plays whenever Oetsu moves. It's not quite Shunpo, but I think it's done to emphasise again just how imperceptibly fast he's actually going. However, with all four members of the Schutzstoffel lying dead at his feet, Oetsu explains how his blade, Sayafushi, is a failure due to its impossible sharpness, but thanks to Yuhabark's invasion, he at least got a chance to put it to use once. I absolutely adore the almost sarcastic way Oetsu says Yuha at the end, challenging this fake name of his. And so chapter 601 was again very faithful to the source material, but the episode still isn't actually finished. In a pretty dramatic change, Askin does not get back up off the ground. Instead, Yuhabart grabs one of his buttons, I think, and launches it outside of the cage of life. As it zooms past the trees and towards the real palace, 
Suddenly, Yuhabak appears exactly where the button was, seemingly trading places with it as the button finds itself back on the wooden walkway far below. Even Hashwolf is shocked by this move. It seems everyone is surprised except for Uryu. On my first watch, as you saw in the live reaction, I wasn't sure what happened here, but it is pretty obvious when the anime focuses in on Uryu himself. Uryu used his shrift, the antithesis, to swap the places of Yuhabak and his button. It's extremely clever and a wonderful new addition. Uryu's shrift, the antithesis, allows him to take two things, clearly apparently both anima and inanima if he wants to, and reverse everything that happens between them. So here the button was outside the cage while Yuha Bark was inside it. Uryu took both of those things and swapped them, allowing his majesty to escape. I mean, it's a great insight into how extraordinarily powerful this ability is, but like I said, I think it is also quite clever. There's potentially an argument to be made, I suppose, that everything is made of reishi at this point, so surely the tree branches should have moved to intercept the button, but maybe it wasn't highly concentrated enough like Lil's bullets are. Plus, it makes more sense, in my opinion, than the source materials version, that is, where Pernida uses the compulsory to simply bust open the cage, which, while it was cool, the compulsory is, again, it technically should be made of reishi, that ability, especially when we know what it actually is. So this is definitely a slightly smarter way of doing it, I think. So this does a few good things in my opinion. Once again, it puts the focus squarely on Uryu, and we actually get to see him use his power to further the villain's plan. The only time we ever see his shrift in the source material is once in his battle against Hashwolf, and it's negated almost immediately. Not only that though, but restructuring the battle like this means we don't now have to rush to the end of the fight so Yuha Buck can escape the cage. He's already done it, and as a result we've suddenly been transported ahead almost three whole chapters to the end of 604. In a new scene, Oetsu commends Yuha Buck for his smart thinking, and Hashwolf wonders if they're going to chase him or not. Speaking of Hashwolf briefly, I wonder if his shocked expression when Uryu used the antithesis was a result of either him not being told that that was the plan, or him merely being surprised that Uryu's power works quite so well. However, Tenjiro wonders the same thing about the Sternritter, basically saying that they should probably go and back Yuhabak up, telling them that not even his hot springs water is capable of washing away Ichibei's bloody stench. I like this moment. Is it a tiny little indicator of how Tenjiro really feels about Ichibe, their sinister overlord? Possibly, or it could just be a simple threat. Tenjiro's way of saying that not even my springs can save you from what Ichibe can do to you. Which, again, we know is true. Ichibe effectively has the power to remove someone from the cycle of life and death thanks to his Futen Taisatsuryo ability. Ichibe seems pretty light-hearted about it, though. He seems to take it on the chin, asking Yuhabak what his thoughts are regarding Tenjiro's words. And again, that feels like a direct threat to Yuhabak, with Ichibe kind of saying, you know... What do you think about that? Do you think it's true that he wouldn't be able to save you from what I can do? The episode comes to an end as Yuhabak demands to be let through to the real palace. Ichibe chastises him for calling him by his name so carelessly once again, before warning him that this time he might lose his voice, as Ichibe finally receives his long overdue splash screen too. Of course, this is the beginning of the titanic, incredible battle between Ichibe and Yuhabak, and already it looks absolutely wonderful. The art looks so stunning here at the very end of the episode. The poem this week comes courtesy of Ichibe and is taken from volume 67, which features him on the cover, and reads the future pitch black upside down. And the title of next week's episode is The Master. In my opinion, this poem could refer to a few things, but if taken literally, it seems to refer to none other than Yuhabak's own future at the point of his near death on the brink of oblivion just before the Almighty returns to him, because in that moment, he is totally covered head to toe in black ink, and he is upside down as he hurtles down towards the Seireite again. So, I mean, that was an absolutely incredible episode, as I've been going on now for ages. We've got a lot of exciting things to look forward to next week, when both episode 25 and 26 will drop at the same time. But first... 
the Sternritter in memoriam returns. And there's not much to say this week in regards to the memorial wall. Sternritter W, the wind, nyanzol, wisol, we hardly knew ye, but you'll take your place here nonetheless. To be fair to Nyanzol, he gets a lot of stick for how little he's around, but at least he did a bit more than Sternritter like Jerome and Berenice, so that's something. Plus, he has the dubious honour of being killed by a Zero Division member. Speaking of which, it seems four other Sternritter died this week too, but you know what, I might just hold off putting them on here for now. Let's just see what happens. Alright, well, predictions. Again, I kind of feel as though I've been predicting these episodes for the last few weeks now, but thanks to episode 24, we possibly have a clearer view of how things will play out. Firstly, chapters 602, 603, and the majority of 604 are conspicuously absent this week, with the anime skipping over them all to get to the start of the Ichibe vs. Yuhabak battle. However, it seems pretty clear to me that we won't see that fight in full until episode 26. One big event still needs to happen. Yuhabak needs to use the Owls Valen to revive his fallen Schutzstoffel, but the question is, when. Let's assume that episode 26 opens with chapter 605, the actual start of Ichibe vs. Yuhabak. That means episode 25 will be working purely retroactively, covering three chapters, 602, 603, and 604. And as you know by now, three chapters is nothing for an episode of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, so there's loads of room for new content. Remember as well that if episode 26 does cover chapters 605 through to 611, that might sound like a lot, but in reality, it's about the same amount of coverage that was in episode 6, The Fire, for featuring, of course, the incredible battle between Yamamoto and Roid Lloyd, and we all saw how good that turned out. That's the good thing about these chapters that are basically just fighting. They can be covered in a fairly short amount of time. Anyway, although it would be cool to see Uryu and Hashwolf take on the Zero Division all by themselves, as seems to be being set up in this episode, I just don't see it happening. Plus, I really want to see the Schutzstoffel up and fighting. So, I predict the episode will begin with the events of 603. Ichibe may say something like, are you sure about leaving those two alone down there? To which Yuhabark then activates the Owls Valen in response. We then see the fates of the Sternritter down below, including Robert, who finally meets his end, as Kyuraku muses that the palace is now in trouble before we return to the fight above. It's possible that we'll skip over 602 completely, leaving us even more room for expanded content and go straight into a new battle between the two sides, which may start with Oetsu being blasted. Or, with the Schutzstoffel revived, one of the fights we see play out might be Oetsu versus Askin from 602. Either way, I can't wait to see what goes down here. It seems likely to me, too, that Uryu will definitely be involved in some way. The anime, as we've been saying for weeks now, has been highlighting him as a villain more than the source material ever did, with him taking a more active role, and this usage of the antithesis is just the latest example of that. So he could definitely be stepping up to fight next week, perhaps using his shrift again, maybe to kill a Zero Division member. Like I've said before many times, I'm really hoping for a balanced battle between both sides. Maybe we get some Shikai reveals from the Zero Division, for example. Tenjiro Shikai has been completely omitted from the anime so far, but maybe that's just because they found a better use for it in the upcoming fight. Put it this way, I would be over the moon with Shikai reveals and even some Shikai explanations for Tenjiro, Senjumaru, and Hikifune. Really, that's the kind of maximum that I'm expecting to get in terms of new content. I almost don't expect Oetsu to have a Shikai for some reason, or I expect him to get taken out first. Either way, there's so much, at least for me personally, kind of riding on episode 25. Episode 24 honestly blew me away, and I'm expecting episode 26 to be huge, an episode similar in scope and polish to episode 6, The Fire. But 25 is the real mystery here, and the one I am most looking forward to next week, when Core 2 comes to an end. But that's it for episode 24 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, too early to win, too late to know. I've had some time to sit on it now and think about it, re-watch it a few times, 
And I really have to say, I do think this is one of the best episodes, not just of the core, but of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime so far. And I hope that trend carries on all the way through to the end of Core 2. So far, the anime is showing it's not afraid to make big changes to the fight in the Royal Palace. And of course, I'm here for that. Amazing artwork, fantastic voice acting, a killer action sequence in the Royal Palace, and of course, massive, frankly, world-shattering reveals that we've been clamouring for for years at the start of the episode make this one of the all-time greats. Let's hope episode 25, The Master, follow suit. All right, guys, but that's it for the video. I really hope you enjoyed it as always. Let me know, of course, your thoughts on episode 24 down in the comments. What did you think of the massive, incredible new flashback at the start of the episode? And of course, my interpretation of events there. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how close you think I am. Maybe I'm off base. I'd love to get your interpretations as well. And of course, what did you think of all of the action going on in the Royal Palace too? And what are your predictions for what's going to go down next week. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts, so please do let me know in the comments. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and until next time, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.